So for today's program, I am very pleased to announce that we have three excellent speakers from around the world. First and foremost, we have Rihanna Jocelyn from the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. She will be speaking about the lived experience of pain treatment and recovery during youth. After this, we will have Alexander Neville from Stanford University School of Medicine in the United States of America. who will be discussing what does diagnostic uncertainty means to adolescents and their family. And finally, we will have my good friend and colleague, Michael Adleff here from Albert University in Denmark, discussing how to help adolescents and chronic musculoskeletal pain through education support on self-management. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jocelyn, if you're ready, I'd like you to share your screen. Perfect. So hello, everybody. It's the afternoon here in the UK. Um, I'm Dr. Rhiannon Jocelyn, and I'm a clinical academic. So I work clinically as a physiotherapist with young people with chronic musculoskeletal pain and also research in that area. So hopefully that will be useful for some discussions later. So I'm looking today at the lived experiences of youth treated with musculoskeletal pain. So the aims of my short session is just to hopefully briefly explain why we need to listen to our service users and then share with you the lived experiences of youth and parents during persistent musculoskeletal pain treatment. And some of the messages for today are from a larger programme of qualitative research. Um, I hope to provide you with three take home messages, either for your future research or your own clinical practice or something to take away for you today. So really briefly, and um, in a nutshell, why we need to listen to young people and their parents is this actually knowledge from patients and families is a key pillar in evidence based practice. So if we're going to deliver the best practice to young people with musculoskeletal pain, we need to get this knowledge. However, something that I deliberate on on a daily basis is even with this knowledge, are we acting on this knowledge from service users? And a, a key point for me was I was part of the guideline development group for the World Health Organization guidelines for chronic pain in children. Um, we were in a privileged position where we were shown all the evidence base, both qualitative and quantitative to make to come up, you know, to group across the world some key guidelines. And while there was huge gaps in the research and we could, some of our guidelines are based on a low certainty of evidence. When we looked at the qualitative research, some of this, these key messages like this one, that physio and psychological treatments were more accepted when they were tailored to the individual. These guidelines could be offered with a high confidence and kept on coming up in qualitative um, studies and Probably today, through these three studies, this will come up again. And my question is, if it keeps on coming up, are we doing it right? Are we actually acting on what service users want? And that drew me back to a study that was done 20 years ago now, uh, where Professor Bernie Carter here in the UK got um, opinions from young people and families who had chronic pain. And a theme from that was professional ventriloquism, where the families and young people felt that actually we as healthcare professionals have our own lens that we place on their narrative and we have our own understanding, we have our own knowledge, we have our own experience, and we sort of pick out parts of the story that we think are most important. And in the process, they feel as the young person that we're twisting their words and actually what we say or what, how we act on their narrative is different to what they say and therefore they feel that we don't listen and we're dismissive and actually I think I keep coming back to this and keep reflecting on this throughout my research and clinical practice. So moving on now to explore the lived experiences of young people and their parents during persistent pain treatment my qualitative program of research looked predominantly at which outcomes mattered most to the young person and parent and there's some studies here that you can look into more detail um, but obviously today for the sake of this um, presentation I've just concentrated on some key messages from this larger program of research. So the population that um, were involved in this um, research, this qualitative um, program of research were young people aged 11 to 18. They were having treatment for persistent musculoskeletal pain. 
um, and the parents of young people who fulfilled that criteria. Being a working in clinical practice, I really, really wanted these young people to represent who I see clinically. So I worked really hard with patient and public involvement um, to, and I worked with NHS, I had NHS ethics to recruit from two hospital sites, which were ge geographically apart that I didn't work in. And I recruited across both secondary and tertiary services. So for those um, listening who maybe use different terminology, I recruited from sort of outpatient physiotherapy departments, outpatient child and mental health departments, orthopedics, rheumatology, as well as tertiary multidisciplinary services. Um, and I wanted to get an idea and a view from different people at different stages of their journeys. So I actually purposive, did purposive sampling to recruit different young people of different sexes, ages and different stages of their journey through treatment. Um, just to give you a bit of a broad background, obviously there's more detail in the papers, but the reported diagnosis sort of covered the sort of diagnosis you would see in typical outpatient departments. So from some young people just use the location like I've got back pain or knee pain to some orthopedic diagnosis or different diagnosis of musculoskeletal pain. Obviously some there said they had an, didn't have a diagnosis. So all young people and parents were interviewed separately where possible. And based on the patient and public involvement, I allowed all participants to choose how they wanted to be interviewed. Um, so at the top here, we can see some were interviewed via, um, the first little diagram is on call, uh, a video call. The second one, face-to-face -face in a hospital, face-to-face -face at home, via WhatsApp messenger or via the telephone. And the sort of YP is the amount of young people that chose that method and the P is the amount of parents that chose that method. So just flexibly. And then all of the participants had this performa, this um, blank piece of paper with a dot at the beginning saying start a treatment and dot at the end saying end of treatment. And they drew and um and wrote down parts of their treatment journey um, from beginning to end. And the end point was when they no longer had to come back to hospital for treatment. And we explored with them what changes happened in their life during treatment, what mattered, what didn't matter, um, positive and negative. So the three um, key take home messages and results that I thought would be beneficial for you today was the first one was that outcomes that mattered to young people and parents changed during the treatment course and that young people and parents focused on different outcomes during treatment. So all of the timelines and all of the interview transcripts were analysed through thematic analysis and there were six themes. Um, the beginning theme, perfect storm, and the end theme, um, free, were a joint theme for parents and young people. And at the start, this perfect storm, um, the focus was very much on the pain intensity and the physical functioning of the child, both from the parents and young person. And on the opposite end, um, when they were free, um, for the young people, it was a focus on social functioning and for the parents, social and emotional functioning of the child. But it was during treatment that the outcomes that the young people and parents focused on were the most different. So in the young people, these turning points and disconnect represented a real focus on their emotional functioning, whereas the, the themes fighting in the dark and drawing a line under it for parents, we'll discuss these a bit in more in a minute, um, there was a real focus on the treatment experience and satisfaction. So it's just that key differences from parents and young people, which we'll talk about in a minute a bit more. So the take home message number two is that during treatment, um, young people describe these key turning points, which we just briefly looked at, and these appeared pivotal to their recovery. So if we just look at a diagram now that a young person drew, you can see the green um, writing is all the positive changes they saw in their life. And you can see a, sh a change in direction here from positive to negative. Um, and then again, you can see a change in direction here from the negative back to the positive. And these were described by the young people as their turning point. So a really specific point in time that they could describe that their narrative took a change in direction and that could be either positive or negative. 
interesting, which would link to probably Alex's talk later, but for this young person, she said, seeing physio, exercises to do, and finding out what the pain is. She also started a new netball team at that positive turning point. Whereas at this point, it was ill in hospital, felt disbelieved, lowered mood, everyone's worrying about me. So it did some key points that they would write on their timeline. So where does the turning point factor in between the themes? So there's lots more to it, but in a just to try and summarise it a bit for you. At the beginning, this perfect storm, it was described by the young people and parents almost like this uncontrollable force, like pain. It was overwhelming and they had no control over it, a bit like a storm that took over the family and the, the young person themselves, like a black cloud that was heavy and burdensome, but they couldn't get, you know, didn't have control over that. Whereas when they got to the end and they were free, they described this escape, um, no longer being trapped, the weight taken off and this spontaneous nature back in life. So someone says, let's go to the fair. And the young person says, yeah, I'll just go because I don't have to think I'll have pain tomorrow. I could just do what I want when I want. And that sort of difference. So the turning point was really interesting because the narrative of the young person changed. So when they hit that negative turning point, the young person would use language like the pain stops me, I can't, it hurts too much, which was much more like that perfect storm sort of beginning theme. And they sort of got trapped in that. Whereas when they hit that positive turning point, the young people would say things like, I just wanted to do it. I got on with it more. I, I wanted to do more. They didn't have no pain they still had pain but they decided they wanted to do something um, and they felt they had that control that perceived control and clinically I hear this all the time now and this helps as well to help you to tailor treatment to know whereabouts this young person is on their sort of trajectory um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide but just to stop you a little bit there were some young people that described a complete disconnect with recovery. So one young person actually just stopped their line and said, actually, I don't feel that I will get to recover, you know, to get to a point where I never have to see healthcare professionals. And another one put my whole life, I'll be seeing healthcare professionals. So this will disconnect. Whereas actually two of the young people talked about a disconnect in the past where they where they felt that, but actually that psychology had reconnected them back onto the positive um, turning point. So it's just something to bear in mind that some of the young people had a complete disconnect with recovery at that lowest point. So what did I do? I was so interested, I was thinking, okay, from a clinical point of view, I need to know more. Like, I, so I analyzed every single positive and negative turning point. And, cause some young people have multiple. And when a young person had a positive turning point, they said things like, I had my eyes on the prize. I saw where I wanted to be and I just focused on that. They felt they were in control of not only their pain, but their life. They took action despite pain and they focused on life outside the body. So their sports, their hobbies, their friends, anything outside the house that made them happy. Um, and they got nearer to recovery. Whereas when I looked at the negative turning points, they used words like I was irreversibly broken. Um, they felt they had no control over their situation or very little. They felt trapped. So they were very fearful. So protected themselves. They described low mood and they focused very much on their pain and their body. So I looked at all of the factors that seemed catalyst for this change. And interestingly, every catalyst for change could go either way. So a relationship could be positive and head towards a positive or it could be negative. And that's with family, friends or healthcare professionals. There was key pivotal moments like, um, especially with healthcare professionals. So when their diagnosis was explained, it could go either way. Being admitted to hospital or discharged from hospital could go either way. And the environment, it was about what interactions could make the environment bigger or could make it even smaller, making trapped almost in their home. So the interesting thing was, because we haven't talked about much intervention, that these young people talked about a lot of interventions. 
um, psychological, physical, pharmacological, dietary interventions. They'd been to 12 different hospitals. They'd been to five different tertiary pain centers. They'd been inpatient and outpatient. But none of that factored into these turning points. What mattered was the actual context of these interventions. So things like the youth feeling connected and supported by the healthcare professional, the relationships about interventions involving new places or different people or different objects or things that were fun outside the home environment or when the pain was explained so it made sense and it was relevant to them as a person and their existing belief so key pivotal moments those sort of contextual influences so last take home message so this is that parents are key team players in the management of musculoskeletal pain they need to trust healthcare professionals and they need to feel supported. So if we all parents that I interviewed started in this stage, which was fighting in the dark, which described the parent doing whatever they could to help their child. And they were in the dark because they didn't know what they were doing, what was wrong with their child. So it, in the words of the parent, they were grabbing at all sorts. But there were three components that kept a parent fighting. And these were the healthcare experience, so difficulty getting access to healthcare professionals. When they got access, they were perceived to be that, that healthcare professional was perceived to be unfamiliar with their child's pain. Um, the healthcare professionals seemed like they lacked understanding and they just didn't feel like they were on the same page as the parents. Potentially, the diagnosis was not what they expected or actually they didn't believe the diagnosis or the treatment plan didn't meet their expectations. If their child was getting worse or staying the same and continuing to be in pain, that made that kept the fight. Um, a really important factor was that actually parents often fighting felt very alone. Um, they were often having disagreement within their own families, with school, um, and these factors led to distrust um, with healthcare professionals, diagnosis and the treatment plan, and just more and more new opinions. And um, if we think back to young people, the more times they got new opinions, actually the more that young person was disempowered, because and the more that it just focused on pain and symptoms, which is taking us down that negative turning point. So we're trying to do, find these solutions for the young person, but actually we're disempowering in the process. And I think sometimes as healthcare professionals, we need to think, are we any different to parents? Are we just fighting to find something that's going to fix a young person rather than empowering the young person? So let's look at the times when parents drew a line under it. So just over half the parents I interviewed got to a point where they drew a line under it. And this was at a point where they could just stop fighting. Um, and this needed three things. So they needed to find even just one healthcare professional, or it could be a team that they trusted, that they perceive that healthcare professional to be understanding and that they want to help them. It didn't matter if they hadn't helped them, it just they wanted to help them. They wanted to be there, they wanted to try. They personally connected with the child and the family and they offered a much more holistic approach, including a psychological dimension to their treatment. They saw progress in their child. It didn't matter if that was physically, emotionally or socially. And the parent ultimately, because their healthcare professional was on their side, they no longer felt alone. So they could sort of have the room to actually be given skills to change their parenting and effectively manage their child's pain and put energy into that whereas before that all their energy was going into fighting they ultimately believed their child would then recover and became an active managed um, member of the team and for me this is a really important point there were three young people that spontaneously improved based on a pivotal moment so two of them was when they went on holiday and one of them was when they um, got, a, got a job. But when there was a flare up or new symptom, because the parent didn't have a health team, that, team they trusted, what happened is they went back to fighting. Whereas if we were in a point where we could draw a line under it 
actually they had a healthcare professional to, they could go back to and they could be reassured or get um, communicate with about these flare-ups and they stayed on that trajectory. So progress of the child alone wasn't enough to draw a line under it. And I think it's a really important distinction. So there are my three key messages and uh, finishes my presentation, but I just want to um, finish with this obviously approach empowers the young person and moves outside of the body. And going back to the child, this to finish with is um, a video that shows the journey of recovery through the eyes of young people who have experienced musculoskeletal persistent pain. Um, and it was designed by young people. So I'm gonna leave you this, with this video. The roller coaster journey, the search for the light. At the start, you feel trapped by the roller coaster. The environment is unfamiliar and the world around you feels heavy and strange. Although you are surrounded by other people, you are segregated. And while others are on this roller coaster with you, they are not in your seat and have a different viewpoint and experience. You feel alone and scared on this journey. You may have expectations or hopes for what is to come, but ultimately you have no idea what is going to happen next and how it will make you feel. The knowledge that there is an endpoint to this experience becomes critical. The vision of an endpoint is like a light at the end of a dark tunnel. Knowing you will be let free from this is like a driving force inside you. Along the journey, there are twists and turns, progressive climbs and fast ascents. Sometimes there are such highs where the light is so bright that the endpoint is crystal clear and you can look at your world from a whole new perspective. Equally, the roller coaster can come crashing down and take you to dark places where the vision of an endpoint gets smaller, blurred, and then invisible. You concentrate on protecting yourself, but this decision traps you in an even smaller space. Feeling lost and in darkness, you bravely reach to form connections with people who are near you. You are no longer alone on this journey. You look for light in a new corner of your environment. You take a chance, let go of your firm grip, and reach your arms in the air. You scream in excitement, realizing enjoyment is possible. With roller coasters full of unexpected surprises, any moment your situation can change, but you realize you have control over what happens next. You rejoin the journey with a different attitude, and somehow, by focusing on those connections with people, those hidden corners of your environment, and those events that shift your thinking, you feel strong and believe you can do this. As you near the end, Warmed by the light, you feel different. The ride becomes fun and the heaviness of the metal around you starts lifting without you realizing. You are freed. At the end of the roller coaster, you are light but unsteady as you regain your energy and thoughts. You smile, realizing how far you have come and what an achievement it has been. It has been a tough journey, but one which has made you appreciate the freedom which you now have. You can do what you want, when you want, and have the childlike spontaneity back in your life. You look around and walk off the roller coaster with familiar smiling faces. They have been on the ride with you. They excitedly talk to you and you realise how important these people are. You talk back with Eve and it feels like you belong. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will uh, move on to the next talk here. So I am equally very pleased to uh, announce that we have Alexander Neville here with us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Neville is from Stanford University School of Medicine in the United States. And she will be discussing what does diagnostic uncertainty means to adolescents and their families. So please, Dr. Neville, if you're ready. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to um, be sharing this research with you today. Um, I'll be talking about this experience of diagnostic uncertainty. I think you'll see a lot of um, similar themes and threads um, through each of our talks today. Uh, I'm a clinical psychology fellow at Stanford at the moment, um, and, and I will be sharing a lot of the personal experience experiences of um, youth and parents with, with chronic pain. 
Um, typically, we think of pain as a symptom, um, and, and you all have perhaps had this experience um, with families um, where, um, you know, they typically think if we you develop a symptom like pain, then you'll um, find the cause of that symptom, go to a doctor, receive treatment, and um, eventually recover from that pain. But in reality, for many of the youth that we work with, um, this path is really not that straightforward. And many youth um, experience this really winding road of many different tests and investigations and consultations with different clinicians. Um, and they receive many differing explanations for their pain along the way. Um, and perhaps the most devastating of all is the we don't we don't know what's happening with your pain. Um, we there's nothing wrong um, and there's nothing we can do for you. Um, and so, of course, many of the youth and families experience a lot of hopelessness in that journey um, and a lot of uncertainty around what this pain is um, and, and how did it develop and, um, and in trying to understand their pain, um, um, they experience this diagnostic uncertainty. Um, so this diagnostic uncertainty is commonly experienced in clinical practice. Um, from the clinician perspective, it's being defined as a subjective perception of an inability to provide an accurate explanation of the patient's health problem. Um, and from a patient perspective, it's really this perception that the label or explanation for a health problem is missing or inaccurate. And Tamar Pincus and Daniela Serbic first looked at diagnostic uncertainty among adults with chronic low back pain, and they found that many adults experience this. They report rece having received a diagnosis, but really believing that there's something else undetected and serious causing their pain, and that uncertainty is linked to worse um, pain and mental health outcomes. And Abby Jordan's early qualitative work really suggested that even after a diagnosis of chronic pain had been provided for children's pain, um, children and um, parents uh, of children with chronic pain really struggled to accept this lack of medical explanation um, and continued this unrelenting search for a diagnosis that would legitimize their pain. Um, but really, this hadn't been explored among um, among pediat in pediatric chronic pain, and so we first wanted to understand this qualitatively. What is this experience for youth and families? So we did these semi-structured qualitative interviews uh, with 20 youth with chronic pain who were recruited from the complex pain clinic as well as the headache clinic um, at a tertiary care uh, center in uh, Alberta, Canada. And we asked these really four simple questions about their journey. Um, the first question we asked was just, where did this all start? This is a really important question because it gets at the origin story. Where does the youth uh, and parent believe that their pain began? And we also ask, where are you now on your journey? Uh, where do you see this all going? And what do you remember about getting a diagnosis? But also, what do you make of that diagnosis? How do you understand it? What does it mean to you? Um, so these interviews were analyzed using reflexive thematic analysis. And these really simple four questions led to this really rich narration um, about these youth and parents' journeys in pain care. Um, and four themes were generated from this analysis. Um, the first was the function of a diagnosis. That diagnosis was really not enough for youth and families. Um, parents and youth really needed more of an explanation for their pain and one that fit with their, under, uh, their beliefs, one that fit for them um, in terms of how they understood their pain. Um, so that term, the label that was provided was often not enough. Um, and as Lauren's mother here describes, um, they said complex regional or chronic regional pain syndrome, um, a whole bunch of words that really tell us nothing about the pain or help us understand it. 
Um, another theme was this haunted by something missing um, that we found that in line with Tamar Pincus's work, um, many youth and families were really haunted by these inklings that something more sinister was being missed by providers. Um, and that negative test results throughout that pain care journey was really not enough to provide any relief from that worry or fear that there could be something really um, life threatening causing the pain. Um, and this led youth and parents to pursue this uh, search for alternative diagnoses, a diagnosis that would legitimize their pain, and often throughout this di this this journey to an alternative diagnosis, um, youth underwent invasive surgical procedures um, in an effort to, as um, Emily's mom describes here, um, get that final validation, um, which for many youth and families was really often we found over the just over the horizon or in the next test or procedure. Um, and this whole journey, a huge aspect of this was this mistrust that developed in the medical system. Um, as uh, Catherine describes here, they, you know, perceiving that physicians were really probably missing things and that they were just diagnosing it because they don't really don't know what's going on. Um, so th these were these components of the phenomenon or experience of diagnostic uncertainty for youth and families. Um, but we have a, a huge access to pain care problem. Um, and in this study, you know, the majority of youth and parents in this study are white and of high socioeconomic status, um, which is congruent with the um, population in many pain care clinics. Um, so, you know, we talk about mistrust in the medical system and what this journey is like for white, high socioeconomic status youth and parents. Um, we really, really need to understand better um, what this journey is like for um, youth and families from minority and marginalized groups who experience uh, additional barriers, additional health disparities and discrimination in the healthcare system. We, we really need to do better at that. Um, we've also quantified this using a, um, Tamar Pincus uh, put forth this topical review that really called for research in this area and put forth these, this really simple brief measure of how we could quantify diagnostic uncertainty. And there are these three simple questions. Um, I've been given a clear label or diagnosis for my pain. I've been given a clear explanation for why I have pain, or I think there's something else going on um, that my doctors haven't found out about yet. So these are really simple three yes or no questions. And when we asked um, 174 youth and parents in a tertiary level care program at Alberta Children's Hospital for pain, um, we found that about 50% of youth and parents perceived um, that they had not been given a clear label or diagnosis for their pain. 57, so even more, 75% of youth um, and about half of parents report they have not been given a clear explanation for their pain. And about a third of youth and parents in tertiary level care were reporting that they believe there's something else happening with their pain, which doctors haven't found out about yet. And this was linked to, um, to worse pain and mental health outcomes. So youth diagnostic uncertainty was linked to greater pain catastrophizing and parent diagnostic uncertainty was linked to uh, greater youth pain and uh, lower health, youth health related quality of life. So this, um, this core question of diagnostic that we think is getting at diagnostic uncertainty um, is, uh, is Im impacting youth and in their pain care. Um, we also know that clinicians experience diagnostic uncertainty as well, and a lot of uncertainty in their um, role in helping and treating youth with uh, chronic pain. So it's not just parents and children. Um, clinicians also grapple with this. From this study with uh, Dr. Abby Jordan at the University of Bath, we know that it's hard for clinicians to know when to draw the line in the sand. At, in, that was in their, their own words and how they described um, trying to 
figure out when to stop ordering diagnostic tests. Um, this is a study with 16 pediatricians in the UK um, who are often the first clinicians that youth and parents present when a pain problem develops. Um, so clinicians really had difficulty navigating this with families, especially um, uncertain and distressed families, um, which many of them are along this journey. And while some clinicians really believed that, um, that uh, negative test results or provide ordering tests and having that um, negative result would provide relief to parents and children. We know from the qualitative data that that's often not true, that that is not a sufficient um, result to provide relief for, to, or alleviate this fear that there could be something else going on. Um, so we know that we have uncertainty from all sides of this clinical encounter. Parents are often uncertain, children are uncertain, and clinicians experience a lot of uncertainty as well. And so we know that uncertainty is a powerful, um, or that the, the clinical encounter itself is a powerful um, driver or part of this um, this experience of uncertainty, but we weren't we weren't sure how, um, and so we collaborated with doctors Lonnie Zeltzer and Marsha Meldrum at UCLA uh, and Ignacy Clement at City University of New York, and we were able to investigate aspects of the clinical encounter that shape uncertainty. Um, with this incredible data. Uh, so these were 26 youth and uh, their parents um, who presented to a tertiary university-based pediatric pain clinic with a chronic pain problem. Um, and initial, the initial intake visits at the clinic were videotaped uh, and youth and parents uh, participated in interviews several months before and after that initial clinical encounter. So from that pre-interview, we're really able to understand what are youth and parents' orientations to um, the diagnosis going into that encounter, what's their understanding of the diagnosis, um, or have they received an explanation for their pain or many explanations? Um, what do they think of that? How certain or uncertain are they going into that initial encounter? And then from the clinical encounter itself, we're able to see what really happened in the room, what was said or not said, what was how was pain explained, um, was the diagnosis provided, um, how did this clinical interaction really go, um, and then from the post-interview, we're able to see what was the impact of that, what did um, families take away from that clinical encounter, and, and what did they do afterwards, uh, did they engage in pain treatment, did they pursue other, other clinicians or other tests or other alternative diagnoses um, for that pain. So this data was analyzed using Using interpretative phenomenological analysis to really understand that complex journey of each individual parent and child, um, which we know is, is complex and really important to understand the details of that. Um, and what the themes that were generated from this analysis, pseudonyms are, are being used here, of course, um, throughout to protect the confidentiality of participants. Um, but what we found was that diagnostic uncertainty is this social phenomenon. It develops over time within clinical encounters through dialogue, through conversation, through messages um, between clinicians and families, um, and that Every clinical encounter along that journey is important. Everyone, every explanation, every, you know, well before even arriving at that, at that tertiary level care um, center for pain. Um, so every journey, every message, every, the language used in those encounters were really important and families remembered and hung on to these different explanations or, um, uh, you know, descriptions of pain or, and, and validation or invalidation that was um, encountered or, or that happened along that journey. So youth and parents really described many of those clinical encounters along their pain care journey as really characterized by a lot of invalidation, a lot of stigma, um, and really conflicting messages for their pain. Um, and embedded in these um, encounters were these um, really contradictory messages, as Damien's mom here describes, that 
At the same time as clinicians devalued the pain, um, they also addressed it as a sign of something more serious. Um, in this case, Damien's mom here is describing this referral to a neurologist as something that really signaled to her that there was something more serious um, um, going on, a reason to, um, for, to pursue this referral. And that was a different message than what had been um, initially communicated by, oh, you don't really hurt that, right? Really invalidating message. Um, so I'll introduce you to some youth in this sample. Um, the first uh, youth in family is Amber, and Amber's journey really highlights the critical role of clinical communication through this language and behavior that I'm talking about um, in shaping diagnostic uncertainty. So in, in Amber's pre-interview, um, she says, you know, I'm scared of finding out that what I have could kill me, right? That, that fear, that that this pain could be something really serious, um, a symptom of something really serious. And um, that's that core aspect of diagnostic uncertainty. Amber's mom too is describing, I just worry that there is something else, you know, worse than acid reflux and explanation and that they've been provided by another clinician and it could be cancer or something. We don't know, right? uncertainty we don't know. So at the pain clinic, uh, we'll go ahead and look at what the what is said in that clinical encounter. Um, the clinician says there's hundreds of tests. I'm sure the doctors have done 10 specific ones, but maybe they didn't do the 11th one. Maybe it's something else. Right? Um, we'll do these other tests, which is specifically for the parasite I'm worried about. So the, the clinician here is really um, conveying through language that there are an infinite number of tests that could be done and should be done to pursue, um, to understand the cause of this pain, um, that there's something to be worried about. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty here, right? a lot of maybe. Um, this is really sending um, these uncertain messages to Amber and, and her mom. Um, and the impact of this several months later is uh, continued uncertainty, continued search um, and belief that there's something else that um, is could be being missed and could not get caught. Um, and that could be life-threatening. This other really, really critical aspect of this journey, um, uh, the journey and but main this clinical encounter in um, this initial clinical encounter was validation. Um, so validation or sometimes invalidation of pain, but also the journey and um, diagnostic uncertainty itself. Uh, so Barbara here uh, is uh, mom describes throughout the pre-interview that they've been on this merry-go-round of doctors' visits um, prior to an, an intake at the tertiary care center. Um, and she describes that she's skeptical, right? Trust, that trust had been eroded over time. I'm skeptical what doctors tell me. What happens at, the, um, at this um, initial intake visit? The physician, after first eliciting Barbara and her mom's origin story for the pain, um, describes you've tried many, many things. You've had many, many tests. You've had many diagnoses along the way. The path has been so difficult to get to. There's been a quest to find a cure. It's got to be exhausting. Did you need to go through this entire workup that you did? Yes, you did. Certainty. We had to make sure there's nothing life-threatening going on. So after Barbara has expressed this um, journey and being, had the opportunity to share her story. The physician validates not only the pain um, that Barbara is experiencing, but also this journey that she's had to go through along the way um, and what that must have been like for her. Um, so, right, validation, communicating to others that their experiences, not just like their experience with pain, but this experience throughout the medical system was is true, accurate, and appropriate given that 
the history, their history um, and the current context, what they've been going through. Um, so this understanding that Barbara and her mom um, experienced in this clinical encounter was really critical to uh, Barbara and her mom um, building trust and buying into this diagnosis that they received at the at this clinic. And they um, they described this in the in the post interview um, that they just, you know, they described feeling really relieved after that um, and that all of a sudden they had a diagnosis when they really hadn't had one before. Um, but from the pre interview, you know, this is quite noteworthy because in the pre interview, we know that Barbara and her mom received many diagnoses for the pain along the way, but this diagnosis felt different. Um, it was a one that fit um, for Barbara and her mom, one that was understandable. And I think a critical aspect of that developing an understanding, a new understanding for their pain was the validation that they experienced in this clinical encounter. So it's really, really critical. Um, another theme that we uh, that was generated was this link between the origin story, as I said, so un eliciting understanding where the child and parent believes their pain began um, and and linking that to the pain explanation. So, uh, you know, Virginia here describes that she was walking her dog um, and she, her dog ran towards her and she went up in the air and walked down. Um, the fall might have triggered the pain. That is Virginia's understanding or beliefs about where this pain began. And many youth and parents in our sample um, had this origin story about where they believed the pain began for them. Um, what did the physician do with this origin story? You got pulled on your uh, pulled and fell on your face. Do I think your whole pain system got turned on then? Absolutely. Certain language again, messaging. Um, do I think the problem here is your brain learned really, really well how to have the pain switch turned on and forgot how to turn it off? Absolutely. So the clinician at this visit um, elicits Virginia's origin story for the pain, tell me your story, and then links that, uses that, connects it, tailors it, tailor, uses it to tailor the pain explanation to Virginia um, to help her understand what's happened um, with this pain. So um, eliciting, listening, tying that functional diagnosis to the origin story and using language that conveys certainty and validates that the pain is real um, was a critical aspect of, of this encounter for Virginia. Um, and what was the impact of that several months later? Clear, obvious, and understandable is how uh, Virginia and her mother describes it. But uncertain or certainty rather is fragile, it's precarious, uh, and it's difficult to maintain. Um, and it's integrally tied to function. We saw this in Damien's story and Ashley's story. You know, Damien, um, at a really critical point in his pain care journey, uh, went back to his pediatrician. And at that um, time when pain was had changed and um, and increased, uh, he received this message from the pediatrician. You know, are is the pain clinic sure? Are they sure this is what it is? Um, and that rekindled or um, increased this doubt that Damien already had about whether or not this um, this diagnosis of CRPS was was accurate for him. Um, and Ashley also describes that at when the pain changed, you know, became exaggerated, um, not as sharp, but um, was just this whole area of excruciating pain. Um, she describes that we just, we went for these other tests to make sure it was nothing with the bones, which was Ashley's origin story for, for her pain. Um, so this is, again, social, a social phenomenon. All clinicians are, that are involved in youth and um, pain care are important. Um, and, and, it, and this is dynamic. It changes over time um, throughout the pain care journey. So what do we take from all this? Um, I think that this research really shows us that it's this uncertainty is experienced um, among children, parents, and clinicians. Um, all we all grapple with uncertainty, um, and diagnostic uncertainty may be linked to poor outcomes. We need to understand that better. Um, it's a social phenomenon. It's shaped within each clinical encounter. 
families have pain origin stories. Um, their story can and should be elicited and listened to, understood and validated. Um, and this story can be connected to the pain explanation and the treatment plan to help families understand their pain better. Validation, I can't stress this enough, um, we should not underestimate the value of validating youth and parents' um, experiences, not just with their pain, but um, their entire journey that's often very difficult and uncertain um, as they're trying to understand this pain. And the language that we use in clinical encounters is really powerful. These incongruent messages of certainty or uncertainty can fuel uncertainty and lead to a lot of confusion for families. Um, and uncertainty is dynamic. It changes. Um, it's tied to function. We really, um, it's likely that we should be assessing this over time um, and, and understanding it in relation to youth functioning. Um, so we're just uncovering these core dimensions of uncertainty and how it might be shaped in these clinical encounters. There's a lot more to understand about um, what, to, what to do with this. Can we hold uncertainty in the clinical encounter and still pursue treatment? Um, and, and how do we manage um, this as clinicians um, going forward are our, our, um, our next steps in this research? I'll just say a thank you to the patient partners that I've worked with in this work. They have been influential. Um, and I encourage anyone doing research to uh, include patient partners in, in work uh, in the research. Uh, Caitlin and Jennifer have been incredibly influential in this work. Uh, my, my mentors, uh, Dr. Laura Simons, my postdoc supervisor at Stanford, and my previous supervisor, Dr. Melanie Noel, my PhD, um, have been incredible mentors throughout my journey as a researcher in understanding um, uncertainty, and then um, are the many collaborators that we've worked with um, and the families that have shared their experiences with us. So thank you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Alexandra. This was a very, very interesting. Uh, so I'm very pleased to present uh, Professor Michael Ratleff here who will be discussing how to help adolescents with chronic musculoskeletal pain through education, support, and support uh, on self-management. So please, Michael. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, quite honored to be uh, presenting together with Rianne and, uh, and Alex, because I've also been quite inspired by, by their work. So this is um, interesting for me. So I'm a professor at uh, Olbo University, where I share my time between the Center for General Practice and Department of Health Science and Technology, where I lead an um, interdisciplinary group of 20 people that physios and medical doctors and sports science and information science that all work surrounding like, musculoskeletal um, health. And um, today I had a really interesting uh, talk with a colleague and we were discussing conflict of interest and also conflict of interest and cognitive biases. And this uh, colleague said to me, Michael, you have very strong biases. Maybe you start to you need to declare them. So I'm actually going to declare my biases today. And um, I'm a physiotherapist by training. But despite I'm a physiotherapist, I think that exercises for treating these pain complaints are overutilized. Overutilized a lot. I'm a quite firm believer in that listening is uh, underutilized. Understanding what our patients understand is underutilized. And I think the whole healthcare sector has such a big interest and focus on direct treatments that they deliver to patients. It doesn't matter if it's adolescents or adults, but there's this incredible focus on the specific direct treatments, if it's pain medicine or specific exercises, and there's too little focus on what we can actually do to support younger people, all those with chronic health complaints when they're outside in the in their own world because they're spending maybe less than 1% of their time together with us. So we need to provide them with the schools and sorry, with the skills and competencies to, to manage their chronic disease or health condition when they're alone outside and away from, uh, from us. So that's my bias. So be aware that that's uh, the lens that I um, see the world through. So um, I'm going to talk about self-management today. And I think it's actually how to set people up for self-management that's going to be the, the focus of the next 20 minutes. Uh, 
some years ago, um, I was talking to uh, a really, really clever guy that's uh, working with me, Simon Johansson, and uh, a few other people in the team. And we've been interested in like self-management for a long time. And one of the things we are discussing a lot is like, how do you become competent in self-managing a chronic disease? Because it's sort of like you you have to learn a skill. It's like math or language skill that it's not something you can just do in a once-off session. So in this study, which is uh, study one in Simon's uh, PhD, which he's going to hand in in a few weeks, hopefully, we um, try to explore this process, this trajectory from the first onset of your pain to you sort of become competent in your self-management. So we recruited uh, adolescents with uh, long-standing pain complaints. The primary pain complaint here was knee pain, but they also had back pain and shoulder pain. So just widespread pain complaints, basically around five years of um, symptom duration. So quite the um, severe end of the spectrum. They are around 20 years of age when we recruited them for this. So they've all been living with um, chronic pain all the way through uh, adolescence. So we did open scope qualitative interviews with them to understand this process and this uh, trajectory. And then two really, really interesting things popped out to us. That there were two really interesting early barriers for how to actually become competent in self-managing your pain complaint. Because what Simon found was that becoming competent in self-management actually happens through four stages or four different steps. And this first step is the apprehension phase. That's where you get the first experiences of your pain. It's an unknown experience. I think for all of you that is listening, maybe think back to the first time you had COVID. I've had it once or twice, but I remember back to thinking a lot about what it is, how does it feel, because it was something completely new and I didn't know what it was. That's similar to young kids that start to experience pain. They get a new onset of a new sensation and then they start to have a concrete experience of that. I might have pain, then I might go out and walk on stairs or I might go out running and I get an experience from, from doing that. And based on that, I start to form these functional theories about why I have pain that might also be influenced by my friends, my parents, the healthcare practitioner that I go visit, as Rianne and Alex also demonstrated. And that is sort of like the first phase. But before we move into the knowledge phase, because when you're in this first apprehension phase, you're not ready to take in information about what to do to actually manage your condition. You're not, you can't take in new knowledge when you're in this stage. You do that in what Simon called the knowledge phase. But an interesting point was that you don't move from the apprehension phase. We call it the apprehension phase, but it's also the phase of unknowns because you're unknown and unsure about what it is you're experiencing. But what happens when you move from apprehension phase to the knowledge phase, that is facilitated by a recognition from authorities. And in most of these cases, these young individuals, it was getting a name and an explanation that actually made them transition in from this, I don't know what it is, I'm worried, I'm fearful, and then they provide, it provides them some level of certainty where they're still unsure, but they're now more sure and able to take in new information. And the interesting thing is that was getting a name and an explanation for their condition. And I think it, it fits so nicely with what Alex just said before, because another way to, to frame this is you have a lot of uncertainty. And then when you get a name and an explanation, you somehow reduce that uncertainty and then you are ready to focus on what can we actually do about it. At least that's my interpretation. But read the paper. I think it's a super nice work with um, from Simon. The second barrier that is a, a barrier towards self-management is actually functional theories. And maybe we just used another term compared to Alex because they also use the term like origin stories about what you believe and what you think about your pain. And what Simon showed was that these functional theories, if you look at the center of the screen, they govern every judgment you make. So, so take an example. Today, I have a lot of back pain and shoulder pain. Luckily, I don't. But if I had, 
I, I need to make decisions every day, multiple times. But today, do I walk the dog or do I stay home and watch Netflix? So that decision, that judgment to go out or stay at home watching Netflix is both determined by social aspects. Is it more socially acceptable to walk the dog? Could also be, what about the last time I walked the dog? My previous experience, did I actually get a flare up from walking the dog or did my pain actually improve when I walked the dog? That influenced my judgment. But what also influenced my judgment is the functional theories. Because what if I thought physical activity is really, really good for me? If I have a strong belief, a strong story about how physical activity is good for me, maybe or most likely that's going to influence my judgment on how I would go out and take a walk. But it could also be that I had a written story, a functional theory about every time I experience pain, it's actually something like a tissue damage in my back or in my knee. And we actually had kids that thought that every time I experienced pain, it was like cartilage in my knee that were tearing away. So every time they felt pain, they backed off because their functional belief, their functional theory was that experiencing pain would wear their cartilage away. And if they did that too many times, they would need a new knee very, very early. So that's really, really interesting. The functional theory, so what they think is important for their behaviors. And I'm getting back to that because I think that might be one of the links between diagnostic uncertainty, explanations, because that is what governs our behaviors mediated through these functional theories about why we have pain, or at least that could be one interpretation. So what I'm trying to convince you of here is when we see these adolescents early on, the communication, the words we use might be really, really important. And also I get back to that, but the name and the explanation that we give, super, super important. So the follow-up study to Simon's uh, first study, which is called Pain Stories, is actually trying to ask ourselves, if we believe this initial clinical encounter is important, how can we then improve it? So what we did was to use a, a methodology from, from Simon's field. He's worked within information science, and it's called like future workshops, where we bought, <clears throat> brought both um, adolescents with chronic pain parents and also clinicians together in specific groups to get them to, to brainstorm on the problems of the clinical encounter and how we could actually improve it. So, and then we used a method called, whoops, tension maps to analyze the clinical encounter. So tension map is a way when you have triangles or even more complex situations of communication to understand where can there be tensions? And I know that every one of you who's been in an encounter, a clinical encounter with both parents, kids, and you being the healthcare practitioner, know that that's a very, very tricky and also complex situation. Sometimes it's just easier to send the parent out the door. So from this study, which was just came out in Jamie just a couple of weeks ago, we tried to understand what are the different tensions that can actually originate in the clinical uh, encounter. And look and behold what came out as four of the main themes. So one is communication again. Communication is key. And that is what can cause the greatest tensions between all different parties that are in the clinical encounter. From the adolescent perspective, they felt that if the communication were between the parent and the general practitioner, that was the most difficult because then they were left out and not given an explanation, a name, information that they could take and use because they thought that the information was all going above their head. And they felt that was one of the most difficult things to see happen in the clinical encounter. Then they also said, I need actionable advice that I can use because all the stuff you say, it's just so hard to remember. Remember these in a GP setting, it would be eight, 10 minutes worth a lot of communication, a lot of advice a lot of different things that you need to remember, both parents and also kids. Some of these kids argue that afterwards, I could remember maybe 10 of it, 10% of it, and that didn't left me with anything that I could use because what they needed, what they needed was a vocabulary. They needed to understand what was happening with them because every day in the schoolyard, a physical education lesson, or when they're with their friends, the friend would ask, hey, why can't you play soccer with us today? And they want 
a vocabulary so they can explain to their friends what's actually happening. Why am I in pain? Why can't I play? So this is something we need to do better because these things are, it's not rocket science, but how do we actually do it better? Because clearly when we ask the adolescents, I think Alex and Rianne's uh, nice data illustrate the exact same point. We need to do better as healthcare practitioners, much better than we're doing it today. So we actually took the next step in, in our, or a lot of clever people working around me, I'm just in the background, is that we tried to take the end user's perspective and try to say, okay, we need, we know that communication, the words we use are really, really important. We also think that if we provide explanations that are really, really good, that might actually help reduce the diagnostic uncertainty, moving them from apprehension uncertainty and to be able to take in new information about what they can do to manage their situation. So we spent quite a bit of time on this project, which we ended up calling Credible Explanations. It's uh, under review right now, but the preprint, you can already... Uh, read that and also use some of the explanations that we've developed. But the whole idea was here to actually co-develop credible explanations that was based on strong evidence, expert clinicians, and also match the user needs and their preferences for communication. So we had a really nice um, couple of students, Melene and Chris and also Henrik, Henrik is a postdoc and Melina and Chris were doing a research here with, uh, with us and they're just about to finish their master thesis. And what they ended up doing was they started out with a systematic review on what is a credible explanation to adolescents with non-traumatic pain. And in their systematic review, where they include a lot of the work that also Alex just showed, they find, found five different domains that were important if we were to give credible trustworthy explanations to adolescents. What they did with um, the systematic search, with, which included both qualitative and quantitative research, and it was focused on non-traumatic knee pain because that was sort of like the model case we used. Um, and model case is an interesting one because it includes a lot of unspecific diagnoses like patellofemoral pain, which is similar to unspecific low back pain. Um, just in the knee, but also some more tissue-specific diagnoses like a jumper's knee or patellar tendinopathy, as we also called it. So what they did was that based on this systematic review and the available evidence, we, including uh, all the authors, some really nice uh, authors from around the world, tried to make up these first editions of um, the explanations. They were actually quite long. When I look back to them now, I don't think they were super good, but it was based on evidence. There was a lot of details. It was quite long. So what we did afterwards were that we um, recruited healthcare practitioners from around the world who's been involved in research as well. And then we used what is called like an argumentative Delphi, what, where we got expert clinicians from around the world in English language to help modify these first iterations of the credible explanations that we made and we made two rounds with them where they continuously helped us iterate and also provide arguments for why it needed to be changed. So we sort of like had this idea of um, evidence-based medicine with both the evidence and clinical expertise and also um, patient preferences. That was one of the ideas as well. After we did that, then we ended up having significantly shorter descriptions of these we used five or was it six different diagnoses to, um, I'm using the model case of patellofemoral pain here today because that's unspecific pain. And I think that this, the descriptions we've developed can match a lot of unspecific pain complaints for, for adolescents. And then we went out to do user testing. So now I think we've included around 30 adolescents with both pain and no pain to really see how do these explanation actually match their needs for um, knowledge? Does it align with what they think can they actually read and understand it? And we've done, I think now, four or five different um, different rounds and continuously modified them to, uh, to improve them. So it's actually intended to be delivered to the adolescents and also to the parents and having also a version for the clinician. Because as Alex and Rianne also indicated, having 
similar explanations throughout the healthcare system for similar complaints. That would be my um, my dream scenario because I think optimizing um, communication, the way we describe things, it's going to solve some of the challenges that we see um, today. So what we uh, ended up with were these um, credible explanations that match these different um, domains that you can see on the right hand side and the upper um, and the upper corner, both that it needed to be multidimensional, it needed to be tailored to adolescents, it needed to provide a validation and reassurance. And they're just feeding back to one of the questions for, um, for Alex is that part of what was really, really important, both from the systematic review, but also from healthcare practitioners and also from the adolescents was that these explanations really needed to, to indicate that it's not something else to provide diagnostic certainty, we also had to convince or describe adequately that nothing has been missed because we also want these explanations to stop people going from going around in the in Denmark, we call it the diagnostic carousel, but circling around the healthcare system and search for a new test that can explain the diagnosis. And um, here in the slides, I just have um, the raw text that we used for um, for patellofemoral pain, which is the unspecific pain complaint where there's no imaging findings, there's no blood test and can help you diagnose it. It's an unspecific, um, unspecific test, but I'll make sure that if you follow me on Twitter, you can see the full paper and also read all the different explanations that we've made. And I think some of these descriptions, how we frame things is very generic. And I think you can use it for a lot of different conditions where it's an unspecific pain complaint. But one thing you can't do is to use it as um, as a standard recipe for how to make the omelet. As one of, I think it was Alex who said, we need to tailor this to the adolescent and their beliefs as well. Sometimes we need to use snippets of it. Sometimes we can use all, but we need to align it with their beliefs. And we need also to challenge their beliefs when it's, uh, when it's needed, I would argue. So that's where I'm trying to, to sum up um, why I think that the words we use and the name, because the name was important, the explanation and the name needed to come together, but both components were actually important for these adolescents. And I think the main, one of the benefits of focusing on diagnostic uncertainty, focusing on credible explanations is maybe we are also going to either challenge or um, make sure that these functional theories, which they have about their pain, can actually change. So instead of going um, towards saying, uh, I have knee pain because I have weak knees, maybe we can provide credible explanations that get them to reconsider why they actually have pain. And then that suddenly becomes our way in for developing self-management support or whatever intervention we're going to use afterwards. And I think one of the things we need to think of as clinicians as well, is that if we don't understand what they understand, if we don't understand their functional theories, are we then setting ourselves up for failure, basically? For what if, what if the functional theory about why they think that they have pain is in direct contrast to what we do? One of the examples from our previous study was a young kid who was just so destined that when he had pain, it was cartilage wearing away. So when I gave him specific exercises for the knee, after a few weeks and we had a talk, why don't you do the exercises? Then suddenly he started to tell me why he didn't want to do the exercises because that would just cause him to have an early knee replacement like his grandfather. If I had known that beforehand, I would have challenged the functional belief to a greater extent. So to sum up, I think the words, the explanations that we use might be even more important than we previously recognized because it sets everyone up for subsequent success and not failure. And I think credible explanations and the way we've developed it together with end users and basing it on evidence is, could be a nice model to pursue in a lot of different unspecific uh, pain complaints. But I think it's also an area that is in rapid growth. We're just starting to scratch the surface of diagnostic uncertainty and how to communicate because we, we just finished another study where we looked at patients with shoulder pain. And for them, the name was not important at all. They couldn't even remember the name, but the explanation that came after the name was what was important for them. 
And that's different from what we saw with these younger individuals with knee pain, for example. Um, and I think the words we use, the labels we use, the explanations we use, they are important because they also govern the behaviors that these adolescents have afterwards. They can either facilitate physical activity, but they can also be the biggest barrier towards all the stuff we want to do afterwards. And um, Rianne, Alex and me, we tried to say we would like like a, a, a final slide to sort of like sum up everything we've been uh, talking about to uh, today. So um, we came up with this idea about an old school versus new school. So an old school approach to helping adolescents with uh, chronic pain complaint is uh, not trying to understand what they and their parents understand. It's not addressing the worries, fears and uncertainty, and it's not acknowledging or understanding the impact of the words we use. And it's about asking a lot of questions, but not really listening to what they say. And here my bias come again, because this was a point that I made, like specific exercises to treat these uh, pain complaints in this paternalistic approach. This is old school. But if you want to take the new school, it's about working with trust, working with trust in healthcare providers and focusing on the language that we use with both young people and also their parents. And it's about providing explanations that make sense to them. And it's about focusing on what is actually meaningful and matters most to these young individuals and not what we think is important. And that all requires a lot of listening skills. And uh, I think that's where we as healthcare practitioners might be able to um, improve. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for wrapping, wrapping this up. <clears throat> the there are different approaches to different people and to different clinicians. And we, of course, need to take these things into account. We are a bit over time here. So I will like to thank all of the attendees for logging in for this webinar. I'll, of course, like to thank the three uh, wonderful speakers that we had here today. Uh, thank you to ISP for helping setting this up. And thank you to uh, the International Patello Femoral Network, Research Network, sorry and the Journal of Orthopedic Sports uh, Physical Therapy for supporting this webinar.